Good afternoon. That was quick. Very, much better than high school students, I have to say. Uh, my name is Patsy Hicks, and I'm Director of Education here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And I want to thank you for coming in, whether you were fleeing the heat or giving up a beautiful day to come and have a wonderful experience with our two guests this afternoon. And in order to maximize the potential, please make sure that your cell phones are turned off. This afternoon, in conjunction with the exhibition Inside Outside, on view through February 18th, we're delighted to welcome celebrated author, Guggenheim Fellow, and UCSB professor, Yunta Huang, who will talk about his latest book, An In-Depth Exploration of Anna Mae Wong, the first Chinese-American film star who both encouraged and defied the Hollywood industry's efforts to categorize her. Huang is joined on the stage in a return to Santa Barbara by our former colleague here, Celine Pereñas Shimizu, film scholar, filmmaker, and dean of the Division of the Arts and distinguished professor of film and media at UC Santa Cruz and a Banana Slug fan, as well as a fashionista. <laughs> Their conversation promises to be both lively and enlightening, and as always, we look forward to your questions and comments to round out the discussion. We'll be walking around. I will be handing one microphone, and Angelica, one of our UCSB student interns, will be helping with the other. She will move more quickly than I, so please indicate you need the mic, and she'll run to you, and I'll hobble. Um, afterwards, and I think a little bit before, as you noticed, Chaucer's our wonderful local independent bookstore, and the marvelous Michael Takauchi, have been assisting with a book signing and will assist afterwards as well. So now, please join me in welcoming these two exceptional scholars, authors, and our longtime colleagues and friends, Yunte Huang and Celine Pereñas Shimizu. Thank you. Is it on? It's on. Thank you so much to Patsy Hicks for inviting me to return to Santa Barbara Museum of Art today, uh, the space where I brought my students when I was teaching at UC Santa Barbara to screen their films here. And this is a particularly special room because my two young sons came with me and I remember them running around this whole space. <laughs> and um, you know, one of them has died since then. So. It's such an emotional time for me just to be in this room and imagine him alive. So I just needed to say that. Um, and we will have an excellent conversation, uh, despite the, uh, or maybe because of the emotions, you know. So um, I am so grateful to return to celebrate the life and work of Anna Mae Wong through the enormous contribution of my UC Santa Barbara colleague, Yun Tae Wong. Yunte, congratulations on this very big, big book that is a gift, not only to the Asian American community, but everyone you know, who is um, enamored by the cinema. This book is not only Anna Mae Wong's uh, biography, but really about the cultural history that produced this figure. So my first question is about cultural history and this concept of iconicity. So for me, this book calls up you know, my favorite books to read. You know, Nayan Shah's book on stranger intimacy, which is about the interracial liaisons in California that happened throughout the last century. I mean, just relationships that we couldn't even fathom were happening cross-racially and in public spaces. You know, interracial gay sex under the Golden Gate Bridge, for example. Or um, my other favorite book, uh, George Chauncey's Gay New York, which is about gay life in New York City in the 1930s and the liaisons that were happening there, the very vibrant gay community that was there pre-Stonewall. So for me, this book really captures this almost impossible feat that Anna Mae Wong accomplished. There was so much in that context that we can't understand, but what we do see is that her iconicity survived you know, decades. And so I wanted to ask um, Yun Tae Wong to help us understand her voice. This is my favorite part of the book is the way in which it's just laden with her voice and this very critical and very sassy voice that Anna Mae Wong had. And let's define iconicity. So this term is 
a term of reverence. You know, it really talks about how a person can achieve so much in their lifetime that they um, attain a kind of godlike state where we worship them, you know, because of what they were able to achieve. So I wanted to ask um, Yonte this question about how this book was born for you, especially because your previous books in this trilogy of the American Rendezvous were focused on men. And we as scholars tend to stay in our lane. I think I'm maybe the only other scholar who talks about both Asian American men and women, other genders, and so do you. So what did you learn about how you needed to write this book in this way, especially in terms of gender, and um, you know how you decided to close the trilogy with her? Okay, well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm so happy to have you back, you know. Working on this book all these years, actually, you're the one who came to my mind all the time because mm. of your earlier work on the productive perversity and you know, the term you used in your first book. But, <clears throat> and thank you all for coming. Um, um, so I want to talk about icons kind of from a different kind of approach because mm. as, you, as you point out, you know, this book, uh, Biography of Anime One was really the, the fi third and the final installment of this trilogy I would like to call Rendezvous with America. Um, as you know, I'm a history buff. You can figure out already <laughs> the word rendezvous, kind of mysterious. But, but uh, you know, the first book is on Charlie Chan. The second book is on the original Siamese twins, Ching and M. Bunker. I will call all of them icons, right? Cultural icons. Um, for Charlie Chan, it's a very an icon in the sense of very popular. When you, when you hear his name, you immediately recall this image, you know, representing something. And it's a very controversial cultural icon. So, and Siamese twins, again, in speaking of impossible feat, you know, <laughs> right. two conjoined twins brought to America as, you know, subhuman um, freak show celebrity, eventually made money for themselves and retired very comfortably to a small town in North Carolina and married two white sisters and they got busy, had 21 children. <laughs> <laughs> About the twists is that they became slave owners, you know, the minute they became rich and got married. So these kind of twists and turns. So as cultural icons, I think, I'm sorry that anyone is joining the crowd in this mm -hmm. way, but I think the overall, my, you know, the 15 years I spent writing these three books was really to tell the Asian American story by mm -hmm. using these three or four icons, depending how you count the Siamese twins, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, three, I would say 3.5 kind of icons to tell the Asian American story in the sense of um, their contribution, mm -hmm. uh, their struggles, and uh, the long march of Asian Americans in the making of American culture and history, really. Mm -hmm. so, you know, Thank you. I don't know why you're stopping, though. I'm so sad that you're stopping at these 3.5 people. Oh. <laughs> like there's so much more. Well, but there you're is. Stopping. Certainly, there's more work, a lot more work to do. Yeah. Certainly, you know. But at this moment, I'm taking a. Well, we can talk about that okay. later. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's <laughs> exactly what I want to do next. Yes. So my next question is about this concept of the ornament and also atmosphere. So you all need to know that the day this book came out, there was just such a beautiful review in the New York Times. And um, it was written by the nonfiction book editor, uh, Jennifer Zalai. And she captures so well you know, your argument. And it's just so great to see them in you know, mainstream news, like this academic argument that's just so accessible. But she basically says Hollywood was just so deeply fascinated with Chinatown and these racialized spaces, these ethnic enclaves, the ethnic businesses that were run there. You know, uh, Chinese are not naturally good at laundry, but they were directed to that profession. And so, um, you know, because of their marginalization in the gold rush, and Yunte just traces all of this. You know, this is something that I also study in my work. Um, my colleagues, Reed Miller, Richard Rodriguez, and I call it the racial mise-en-scene. Mise-en-scene is the world making of a film. So this is, you know, what Yunte does. He talks about the racial mise-en-scene that, that uh, contextualizes Anna May Wong's life. There's another book that I hope you can also check out by the Princeton scholar Anne on Lin Cheng, who Yunte cites just you know, so well in this book. It's this book called Ornamentalism. And in this book, she makes the argument that you know, Anna Mae Wong was known for having the longest nails in Hollywood. 
this was not fake. She cultivated these nails. Every time she took on oil, she's like, do I have to cut my nails? You know? And so, but at the same time, you know, she had these risque costumes. She also had other accoutrements of racial femininity that, you know, that were kind of, um, you know, super risque because they were, she was kind of naked. But she also deployed her, her heritage in this way, you know, she would sign, you know, it's just so well done in this book, she would sign her pictures orientally yours, you know. So she really was kind of saying, you know, like, I'm kind of bound by this racial feminization and I'm going to put it in your face. So, you know, and she also, you know, was so skilled at um, critiquing the parts, you know, she had to play. So in this book by um, Anne Onling Chen, she basically says, the injury of Anna Mae Wong is aestheticized into such beauty. Isn't that crazy? Like your injury is aestheticized. Your harm is uh, represented as a pleasure for viewers. So painful, right? Like people, people, you know, enjoying, you know, inflicting your dehumanization, you know, on screen. So, so my question for you is, in your research, please say more about how she navigated this objectification that occurred not only in the scenes of real life, but also in this aesthetic seduction on screen. What did you have to throw away in terms of talking about you know, how she resisted this, you know, this powerful racial feminization that she experienced, especially because as you do so well in your book, she traversed so many cities. She represented you know, global cosmopolitanism. She found herself the only person of color in the room of white people at the time when Hitler was coming into town, you know? So what, what did you have to throw away or what could you share with us about that negotiation that she was forced to do? So, well, thank you. I think that the quote from, you know, <coughs> Anne Ching is very appropriate, of course, apropos for the ornamentalism, right? Um, I got that from her book, but also very importantly got it from <coughs> this uh, great um, a German the film, you know, theorist. Everybody quotes Ben, I mean, I do too, but yeah. actually, Karl Kau, Kau, right? That's how you say his last name. Uh, Sigis, Sigis Fried, mm -hmm. uh, Kraukau. Kraukauer. Kraukauer. He, he, yeah. he actually writes about, you know, ornamentalism. That's right. In the mass, in the mass media, <clears throat> in the production. What I learned from him, going back to exoticism in Chinese, in terms of realism and everything, Chinatown provided the first kind of live stream, you know, <laughs> exotic live stream, uh, feed uh, mm -hmm. for the film industry mm -hmm. because in the early years, uh, um, I think the cameras are static. They just put a camera there and there's mm -hmm. no close up or anything and they're just taking the street scene. So as it turns out, you know, um, at the time, traffic in LA was still pretty good. You don't, <laughs> you get a truck. It's a very easy drive across town to come to Chinatown and use the exotic, you know, people with co exotic costumes with the barbecue pork and ducks hanging on the window. You're just <laughs> taking everything. And turns out, you know, a laundry man, mm -hmm. because of the robotic kind of movement and, and everything, became a favorite, um, I guess, motif uh, mm -hmm. for early films, silent films. And, and they're free as well. And in that context, it also feeds into the racial imagination that somehow Chinamen are Superman because they can work mm. all day, all night, not having to stop, and that's how they stole, you know, white <coughs> laborers' jobs as mm -hmm. well. And so everything is tied in together, this exoticism, the, the, the free kind of feed and everything. And, but what I found out through the Anime One, you know, researching Anime One, and she's really part of this, first of all, uh, you know, in the, litany of uh, injustices uh, done to Chinatown or, or Chinese Asian Americans in early years, they often were described as just, you know, uh, victims, mm -hmm. weak victims. They can't right. talk back, can't fight back. But actually, it's totally not true, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, after the 1871 uh, Chinese massacre in LA, uh, when Ch two 18 Chinese were, you know, tortured and burned and lynched and shot, killed, Actually, the community came together. You mm -hmm. know, if the if they face facing kind of um, racism, violence, um, they withdrew into themselves, became mm -hmm. even stronger, and that's really the I think the cultural milieu in Chinatown. Uh, Anime One was born into, and in a way, she's that kind of person as well, facing enormous kind of obstacles despite mm -hmm. her beauty and talent, 
anywhere, you know, everywhere mm -hmm. almost. Uh, you know, I'm in, in LA, in America, went to Europe, became a bigger star, and then she went to China facing the same kind of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, gender bias and, mm -hmm. and criticism, and she never stopped. So mm -hmm. speaking of kind of how the statisization of somebody's pain and how you turn into that, First of all, I learned it from you know, my experience writing about Siamese twins. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm speaking of kind of freakish, kind of the painful physical abnormality, disability and everything. And they knew exactly what they were doing and they, mm -hmm. they took advantage of that. Uh, in a way, you know, laugh at the audience, paying, you know, they are insulted by them, of course, by the customers and all that, the abuse. Mm -hmm. they, they suffer all the abuses and everything, uh, then, you know, they knew what they were doing. So in many sense, um, in many ways, uh, anyone knew what she was doing, right? So if you look at her letters, she would say, um, you know, I'm making this film, I had to sacrifice my nails, like yeah. too bad, you know, to, to make her characters. Like she spent years, of course, you know, uh, curated this, uh, you know, long nail and making of uh, Daughter of Shanghai, the director said, well, you know, you're playing a very decent, nice, like doctor, you know, character, you can't have no nails, and she had to sacrifice. So she would write to friends and say, you know, this is like pure hokum. <laughs> the film is pure hokum, you know, bullshit. <laughs> but, but she took Hollywood hokum seriously, and she, mm. you know, sacrificed her nails and did all the work. And mm. so in that sense, um, I learned it from the Chinese community, the history of the suffering, the pain, the violence against them. Anyone wants, you know, a kind of suffering, the pain, torture. But overall, I learned it from my, grand, you know, my grandmother, who had a round feet. Mm. And speaking of aestheticization of, of female kind of beauty and pain, mm. nothing is more torturous and painful than having your feet bound just for the pleasure of male gaze. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I came to this UA through all these kind of personal and historical yeah. and, and cultural you know, right. understandings. My next question is related, you know, I mean, so vivid the way you talk about bound feet and the way it restricted, you know, women's mobility, right? So the um, life of Anna Mae Wong, you know, she was alive in the first half of the last century. Um, it's hard not to think about space and race because of the way people were segregated. So Yun Tae's book opens with the way in which Anna Mae Wong was bullied in the streets of Chinatown. But she also um, became tethered in some ways to the promise of the technology of cinema that she wanted to get involved in because Hollywood kept coming to Chinatown you know, to film um, the space. And there's this super dramatic ending, sorry, sharing the ending a little bit, um, of the book, where she is just drinking the days away at this bar called the Den of the Dragon, the Dragon's Dragon, Den, the Dragon Den with you know, all of these other Asian American you know, Hollywood people. And, you know, there's all these stories about how, you know, when she was navigating, you know, she traveled everywhere, you know, Berlin, uh, Paris, uh, London, you know, different parts of China, the Philippines. She was such a global superstar. At the same time, she was trying to find home and where she truly belonged. And so there were times when her family would um, take her back in to the house. You know, she had this place in the back of the laundry, which, of course, the newspapers loved. Like, oh, she's so humble. She lives in the back of the laundry, you know. So I'd like you to talk about um, the historical context of how people of color, Asian Americans, were really controlled by the inability to move, you know, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And, you know, these laws were not lifted, like, until later in her life, where people could not come in and out. But there she was. Did her celebrity exceptionalism enable her, you know, to move in ways that her community was not? So just say more about the discourse of space and oh, race. Oh, yeah, sure. So <clears throat> once again, going back to laundromat, right? Um, so it's kind of curse blessing in the sense that she was born in laundromat because of uh, <clears throat> racial policies that Chinese or Asian Americans were not allowed to live outside of Chinatown. Mm -hmm. Unless the exception is that if you live in your business and therefore a laundromat moving out of Chinatown, then you can stay in, otherwise they wouldn't be able to live in other neighborhoods. The same way for like a lot of Afro Americans in early years, like barber shop. You know, it, that's you know, people don't want to go into Chinatown to do laundry or have a haircut to, to black neighborhoods. 
And that's how this, in some ways, her father, her parents were the, the vanguard in a sense of moving out of this controlled space through this loophole. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it's kind of image captures what she was doing, right? Um, so, but also your, I'm thinking, stepping back to say my scholarly work, and if this is scholarly, but it written is, in a more is. popular, <laughs> <laughs> so like an academic book, so-called, right? I work earlier, I, I write about Trans-Pacific. Trans-Pacific is really spatial imagination, right? Mm -hmm. I think it was a your Stanford professor, like David Palinda Blue, who yeah. wrote about, you know, somehow California is really the frontier, of, right? You know, mm -hmm. of uh, the kind of racial management, spatial management. Mm -hmm. Thinking about Japanese internment during World War II, uh, because if you're Japanese living on the East Coast, you're okay. You won't be, in you know, uh, put in prison. So California is really is like the frontier. That what we call the uh, today, go ghettoization, people is segregated. So everything ties in together in some sense. But when it comes to border crossing, um, so she, um, I, you know, like many of us, we cross borders. And uh, now I'm a citizen, of course. I can so called travel freely, but not really. Mm -hmm. right? I think it's the one thing people don't understand that when you struggle to cross borders, the, the trauma, in some sense, the nightmare, the, you know, the haunting nightmare, the fear, kind of haunts you throughout your life, no matter what paper you carry. Mm -hmm. The wall is always there. And so for her, especially, she was very careful. And all the time, before any trip, she will make sure her paperwork's are in right order. And she actually made a mistake one day, right? Was, uh, she was going with a group, uh, I think um, uh, a vaudeville group, uh, going to Canada. And, um, and then she was, they were taking a train. She made a mistake of step off the train for a minute. Oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> and she couldn't come back because the Canadian border guards, oh, no, no, this is not like border crossing town for you guys. You have to go, there's a designated point of entry. She had to travel, so the, two, the group had to move on, you know, leaving her behind. And she alone had to travel like a few hundred miles to yeah. like New York to cross the border from another entry, like up the state of New York or somewhere. So this is this kind of experience that made her, despite the fact she was a global star icon with a lot of mobility and everything, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, she had to go to Europe to be considered, to be accepted as American, because here she's just one of the Chinese, you know, chi one Chinese, and then of course later on she had to go to uh, Australia to be recognized as Chinese, because mm -hmm. when she went to mainland, mainland Chinese will also have ambivalent views about, you know. So this kind of exclusion, it's not, of course, American monopoly, you know. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's in China as well, you know, everywhere. So. And so she is really an example in terms of border crossing, facing the limit, going back to her early years experience of living laundryman and everything, so. You know, if you haven't seen the body of work of Anna Mae Wong, it's just so wonderful that this book by Yun Tae exists because I was able to watch Shanghai Express again, knowing this background of her, the own, her own restrictions and mobility. That just makes you realize how she herself was trying to be in conversation with her movies. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so just uh, so thank goodness for a Criterion collection, you can find her, her <laughs> films, right? And well, thanks read. to Arthur Dong, who yeah. curated the whole right. you know, the series. Yeah, so there's an Asian American mafia posse in Hollywood making all of this happen, and then of course this book as well. Um, so I'm going to ask a question about money because I'm a dean and I think about money in the academy and working with donors. And if Anna Mae Wong existed today, much like the way I'm trying to chase the owners of Panda Express so I can become the Panda Express Dean of the Arts, mm. like Anna Mae Wong would be great, like the Anna Mae Wong Dean of the Arts, you know, would be pretty cool. You already cool. had that in yeah. uh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> That's true. Postdoc. UPenn, UPenn has that, UPenn. so I'm very <laughs> jealous. So, you know, you know, like Anna Mae, like many Asian Americans in philanthropy, people who give today, Anna Mae Wong really generously supported charities as well as her own family. You know, she helped um, her brother you know, fund a store. And of course, I had to look up her real estate properties because Yonte did me the favor of being, of empowering my real estate porn search. <laughs> so you could see, you know, the house that she bought when she finally made money, she turned it into four unit apartment building. And then it became a 34 unit apartment building when she had to sell it. It's currently for sale right now for $10 million. For 34 units, seems pretty good. And then the house she died in is also, is not for sale. 
but it's great. It's it's not it's too possible. far. I just yeah. went in. We can tell that. I can tell See, that story. I'm gonna ask you that story. Yes. So, uh, her her house that she died in is now owned by you know uh, an Asian American Hollywood executive. And I was like, wow, a bit of poetic justice there. But um, I'd love to hear stories like that. I also want to hear: Are you in touch with her family? And you also need to just get to the ending of this book because it's so moving. Um, Yunte visits her grave, um, and. I also want to see, like, have people contacted you who have been a part of her family in order to share with you her legacy and impact? I just also want to make a plug. When you buy Yonte's book, you're going to get a free Anime Wong coin out there today. Go ahead, Yonte. Yeah. Well, thank you. So um, field trips are apparently very important when you write about you know, people and uh, cemetery especially. And I was taught by a, a poet in Buffalo one one of the graduate seminar sessions is always devoted to just a free walk in a you know forest long <laughs> cemetery. Yeah, yeah. Every town is forest long in downtown. It was freaking me out at the time. Later on, I learned to appreciate it. But anyway, so property. So she made yes decent amount of money, but nowhere comparable, say to you know just one example, Shanghai Express, right? Uh, Malina Dietrich, the the star. Uh, her salary for the film was 76000 um, And for her, it uh, was 6000 right? Um, but that was still a lot of money for her at the time. For, and, uh, so, and she's very careful uh, because early years of, you know, um, the abacus calculation, mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, despite her earlier success, she continued to support her father, you know, mm -hmm. by manning the, the laundromat doing mm -hmm. account book and everything, and, uh, and also send her brothers to school you know, to go to college. So she contributed a lot, but she's always very careful with money and never overspend, really. Uh, but she's also a very generous um, mm -hmm. you know, campaign donor as mm -hmm. well, especially when China went, to, uh, went to, um, into war with Japan um, after 1937. Mm -hmm. And her energies were really devoted to um, China aid. She sold, you know, the, the robes, Chinese robes, and mm -hmm. donated you know, her jewelries and everything. But real estate. So earlier we talked about spatial management. And of course, you know, in house search, she encountered, mm -hmm. shockingly, of course, there are houses that she will not be allowed to buy in mm -hmm. China. You know, I mean, you, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, house owners here. When you get the deeds, you know they go back like 100 years or 80 years, and still you can, if you read carefully, then you will find clauses. You know these houses not yes. to be sold to Jews or, or African blacks or Chinese or Japanese. So her, 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 you know, house search was limited apparently in terms of spatial uh, in space, but she managed to buy um, real estate. I mean today it would be impossible because mm -hmm. now it's like the posh neighborhood yeah. of Santa Monica. But in those years, fortunately, well, that's when the German, you know, the uh, immigrants coming in at the time and just raising the, the kind of beach corner, you know, the status. Um, so she managed to buy one, you know, two plots of land that converted, mm -hmm. as you pointed out. Eventually, she had to sell. And so the house, eventually, she moved into a much smaller uh, place in uh, Santa Monica. Today, it's called the Gillette Square. It's mm -hmm. the Gillette Shaving the, the mm -hmm. owner bought the whole plot and divided into that's called Gillette uh, Square today. So her house was there. So anyway, when I was doing the research, um, I drove around apparently, you know, the same way I did for say for the Charlie Chang book when I searched for the traces of Changapana, the real Charlie Chang in Hawaii, um, and then went to North Carolina, of course, uh, Mount Airy, um, you know, looking at the the Chang'e and Bunker, original Siamese twins, their, their farms are still there, now mm -hmm. divided by a highway. Um, so the same way with Anime Wang. So I drove around in Santa Monica, and of course, it is like today, like you say, it's multi-million dollar houses. And I'm a little bit shy. I, I don't want to lock on, knock on the door and say, can I take a peek? Right? <laughs> so I just drove around, you know, feel the feng shui and everything, and I'm happy <laughs> with it. I come back and I write about it, and I write about it. But then, of course, when the book was coming out, uh, you know, New York Times was sending over this, uh, uh, you know, Casey Schwartz. At the time, I didn't know who she's, who is going to be. They wanted to interview me in LA uh, for this book, and um, so okay. 
So, so I, I planned the itinerary when I knew it was a Casey Schwartz, a, a Brown graduate, um, who is also a you know, nonfiction writer herself. And so one of the you know, stops we made was uh, the final house where she died in, right? <laughs> so we just put, I, so I, I drove her to the Gillette Square and we pulled over. And we came out and Casey said, uh, well, let's take a walk. I was like, you know, okay, let's take a walk. I was like a little dog following <laughs> <laughs> this New York Times journalist. I was very careful. And so, and then we just like took a few steps and there was a car pulling, you know, pulling, pulling to the curb. I was like, oh, maybe that's the owner. So, and a lady came out, uh, her car. And so Casey said, hey, are you the, do you live here? And she said, no, I don't, but my friend does. <laughs> and the friend coming out the house, like, hey, hey. So, okay. So, hey, hey, I already did a research. Who's living there? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like you. I, yeah. know the, <laughs> I know the market price. And yeah, the me owner too. <laughs> just moved in. Actually, like, during about, like, when pandemic was, you know, breaking out. And this is, like, their, you know, rich family's getaway place, you know, because they want a bigger space. They used to live on the, close to the beach. And now they want a bigger space. So they just moved in before pandemic broke out. And, and I know the price and everything. Um, Eight million. So, so they came out. <laughs> she came out. And then I said, well, Casey, like, you, you, you're New York Times. Just go talk. <laughs> you know, because I'm too shy. The last time when I was here, I didn't knock on the door. So we went in. We were invited in. Of course, the house is gone. The location you know, is there, the same uh, address. But the house is already different. It used to be like a, a single story Spanish bungalow, yeah. uh, you know, Adobe bungalow. But now it's kind of two story, very nice house. But the lady said, uh, well, the backyard swimming pool may be old, you know. Uh, so she said, I just cleaned up, I didn't do anything. So we went to the, went to take a look. And, you know, I like to, uh, to put people on the spot and, and <laughs> do things. So, so we look around. And I said, oh my god, there's a signature. She was like, oh, really? Almost tripped over and <laughs> fell into the pool. I feel so sorry. Of course, was, uh, sorry, it was a joke. You know, oh, so <laughs> my god. Not so shy yeah. after yeah, all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I get into the door, <laughs> outside the door, yes, I'm very shy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, so um, but apparently now, the owner knows. Actually, we asked her, do you know this is where Anime Wang used to live? She said, I don't know. Wow. And do you know who she is? She said, of course. And we said, oh, that, do you know where this is the warehouse where she died in? She said, oh, my God, when? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, yesterday. And I said, 1961. Said, oh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> but of course, now the, the house just went up in value by another one or two million dollars. Easily. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have another question about the comparative racializations of African Americans and Asian Americans because mm -hmm. there are some key moments in in the book where you talk about you know um, that there were limits to their stardom. Of course, um, you know one of the biggest contributions of this book is the way in which it really documents the Hollywood obsession with Chinatowns and spaces. You know, I mean, it's just a, such a massive contribution in terms of. Film studies. We know so much more about African American cinema, which is one of the most important traditions in in cinema studies. But not as much about Asian American cinema. So this is just. I'm so grateful, you know, for Yante's work on this. There are moments, however, that are so illuminating in terms of understanding African Americans and Asian Americans. Both Josephine Baker had to, you know, who was a star, had to leave the United States. I mean, leave and give up her citizenship, for example. And then there were also, and you know, similarly, Anna Mae Wong also had to travel, but then she came back. It, it, the book kind of documents how she both felt belonging and non-belonging in the US, and how is that different for African Americans? And then the second thing is, you know, she also had such a devotion to China, you know, and, and to Asia. And then the third is, you know, the yellow face and uh, black face, both. So I wanted to ask you, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about, you know, comparative stardoms? You know, I think a lot about the way in which Josephine Baker deployed photography, you know, to show off her talent. Anna Mae Wong was such an expert in deploying the glamour photo to express her power. Mm -hmm. Dolores Del Rio, who was supposedly her, one of her lovers as well. It's so interesting to think about how women of color navigated Hollywood. 
Right. So absolutely, uh, there's a, a lot of analogies apparently between you know uh, Asian Americans in Hollywood, uh, their cultural experience, and uh, also African Americans. But there's certain limit to their analogy apparently. So mm -hmm. my early encounter with this analogy apparently was through Yellow Face, through about writing about Charlie Chan, the Yellow Face, uh, you know, Warner Olin, Swedish actor doing Charlie Chan, Chinese character. Compare that to say Stepping Fetch It, you know, blackface. And one thing we learn from that kind of uh, film's uh, practice uh, is that uh, either blackface or yellow face is not just about you know, white Caucasian actors doing these colored characters. It's actually also about Chinese or Asian character, uh, actors or black characters, actors doing black characters, but somehow bound to this tradition of mm -hmm. kind of uh, kind of almost artistic, you know, kind of stereotype mm -hmm. is pre-established. That's something you have to struggle against, right? And that's what I learned from, say, your colleague, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Yiman Wang yeah. about yellow, yellow face in the terms of the same way as that like stepping fetcher, um, still kind of maligned figure mm -hmm. in African American studies today because of his success and he's kind of perpetuating the Negro stereotype. But one argument can be made is that he kind of exploded that stereotype playing it to such an excess that it becomes unbelievable, become artificial rather than realistic. So in the same way, if you look at Anime Wong, you know, like in Drag, you know, the late Daughter of a Dragon, that a lot of people don't like that movie because it's so artificial, and it's like, it's unreal, so Dragon Lady is stereotype. So the, I guess, you know, one way to look at it is exactly, um, they, they know what they're doing to some extent, and mm -hmm. they're up against this wall, and there's a very limited space for them to perform yeah. their art. So Joseph and Baker, the difference is that, like you point out, Joseph and Baker became a big star in Europe, but when she came back, tried to make it, she still failed. And that's really the tragedy of you know, African Americans in many ways in this country. You know, a few years ago, I was judging the National Book Award. One book I really was fighting for is Afro-Pessimism by mm. you know, our, our UC colleague, uh, UC uh, Irvine colleague. Um, there is, you know, one thing that's not comparable in some sense, and it, you really need to understand not just through Enemy Wong or Step and Fetch It, but really the long arch of history, you know, from slavery or the Chinese experience, or Asian American experience is very different, right? Just to give you one example. So I know my dear colleague Candice is here. So this is the Alabama story, right? When I first got to America, you know, I was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, roll tie roll. Um, on Sundays, um, I would go like hitchhiking, you know, uh, not hitchhiking, yeah, I, I didn't have a car, but I wanted to go to church, you know, to learn English, to learn about local culture and everything. And I always carry a, you know, a Bible, and I, 11 o'clock Sunday morning, I, I was then across road, and people would stop for me, like, what church are you going? And I always say, yours, because I didn't care which one I'm going. <laughs> but of course, I ended up going to many churches, many denominations, and, and everything, mostly Baptist. Um, but then some years later, when Alabama was passing these kind of totally kind of, you know, uh, draconian laws against cracking down on uh, illegal kind of migrant workers to drive them out of the states. So they passed laws that, you know, if you give a ride to uh, somebody who turned out to be, an, you know, an illegal immigrant, then you'll be in trouble. So, so I wrote a you know, New York Times op-ed piece about that, describing my experience hitchhiking and all that. Then, of course, I realized my kind of blind spot in this op-ed piece. As, I, as, I'm, you know, as much as I'm fond of my own anecdote, I realized if I were a black man hitchhiking, nobody would stop for me, really. Mm -hmm. And that's really the limit of this kind of you know, analogy. And of course, today, I'm fortunate as the affirmative action case. Once again, it's you know, Asian and Chinese Americans up against yeah. a different racial group. And so there is a... There's a way to compare, but there's also, you know, there's a line to, to draw as well. Right? Yeah. I'm going to ask two more questions and we're going to open it up, so please get ready. Um, uh, my next question is about anime and solidarity, which basically means who did she have beef with and who did she hang out with? Um, you know, today we see Sandra Oh, the, the you know, another prominent Asian American woman star. She has this shirt that says it's an honor just to be Asian. But really, I think it was Anna Mae Wong who kind of pioneered, you know, that spirit. She didn't have a t-shirt, of course, 
But um, she has a cootie jacket. Yeah, she. I mean, look at you know this kind of style. You know, this is she was a maximalist, and when she walked into a room, you knew it. And she herself wasn't only an actor; she was also, you know, a producer. But but mainly, you know, she was the first of her kind. You know, at, you know, really at the very beginnings of the cinema, the first of her kind. You know, Asian American female movie star in a way that, that we still don't have today. You know, the kind of achievement that she had. And so I'm thinking a lot about the way she died and how she was hanging out with, you know, um, James um, Wong, Wong Hao, Hao. Yeah. you know, the, the famous cinematographer who had to hide his white wife. And then I'm also thinking about, you know, the way in which, you know, so many movies, I, I, one of the pleasures of preparing for this interview today is reading all of the Hollywood biographies because I just kept thinking, you know, like, Anna Mae Wong, you know, achieved such a glamorous splendor. But at the same time, she had a bar that I think other people, you know, really didn't have, you know, in terms of what she was fighting against. And so I want, and you know, there was all these rumors that you kind of can get into it a little bit. She had like, you know, she was lovers with Marlena Dietrich. She was lovers with Dolores Del Rio. So who did she hang out with? Who did she have beef with? And, um, you know, what can we learn from her? Because to me, whenever I look at her, I always feel like she's talking to me. Like across decades, she's telling me like, Things are possible, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. So talking to me in terms of, you know, yes. Um, so of course, um, people ask you this question a lot, like what made you write about her, right? That's the mm -hmm. easiest question, but it was the most difficult to answer. And once again, I would, you know, one time when there was a uh, podcast just a few months ago, host, for me, the first question is exactly what, what made you write about her? And I would say, well, she's my great aunt. And uh, you know, I said, oh, really? Oh, my god. Well, no, it's a joke, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Fictional. <laughs> <laughs> the same way like, people ask me, like, why did you write about Charlie Chan? I said, well, she, he's my grandfather. They're like, oh, really? <laughs> oh, well, yeah. well, you know, that's, that's really the fun, you know. I had living in America because people are so gullible in a sense. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> because if you read the New York Times, you believe everything is as it says. Because growing up in China, if you read newspaper and they say you have to read between lines, very simple. Um, so who she hangs out with? Um, she talks to me all the time. Yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. In 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 a sense, this kind of the bar you're talking about. Um, she's a very introvert person. Uh, discreet. Mm. She's definitely not the kind of celebrity who will profit or try to profit from her scandals. And that really marks her totally different. Mm. So the other question I had the other day from another kind of po ho uh, podcast host was that um, if you were, you know, if you had one question for her, mm. what would it be? And I thought, oh man, um, because I was asked that question by another host uh, when I was, you know, did the interview for um, Samuel's twins book. Like, if you were to meet the twins today, what, what would you ask them? At the time, I would, my question was like, why, you know, why you never went home? Because after they what left Sam, they never went back to their mother. The mother passed away. Why? You know, because at the time, my father just passed away, and I couldn't get there in time. The distance you know, that, that mm. hangs over me. For her, my answer to that question was, the, what would you ask her? Was that, did you have fun? Mm. Really, as a woman, as an actor, as a success, given all your struggle, I mean, what, what, what is life about? You know, whether or not you have fun, given the struggle. We understand her pain, her struggle, her success, and her you know, heartbreaking kind of disappointments with the great good earth, and especially, of course, her, you know, the, the end is not that so pretty, but really kind of sobering, right? You know, she died while her screenplay, right? You know, because she was about to make the big comeback, right? For those fans of Sunset Boulevard, um, her career went to decline, right? Uh, almost as soon as she hit late 30 or early 40. And Hollywood's ageism, of course, is still totally around. And for her especially, so she was, became very kind of lonely, celibate, and uh, she's not somebody who really, like I said, um, you know, if she had fun, she would not tell you, apparently. Mm -hmm. So there are some kind of remarks I, I got from readers say, how come, like, how come you don't quote her directly? Actually, I did quote her mm -hmm. directly a lot from her letters and everything. But there's one thing I'm very careful in terms of uh, 
writing, you know, is that I, I'm not a big fan of this kind of psychological realism, mm -hmm. like Henry James, you know, like Portrait of a Lady, I'm a big fan of Portrait of a Lady. There's one chapter like Isabel Archer, right? Nothing happened in that chapter. Isabel Archer sat, sits in a chair. Everything goes on in her head, the entirety. When it comes to writing these books, the studying, you know, writing biographies, so-called, um, I'm kind of careful in terms of, I, I, I rely on the data on the, on the archive. But in terms of how I want to kind of show what they're thinking, what they're going through, um, I guess I was trained more in the sense of, um, with more sensitivity to, to form. Like you study film as the form, I study poetry. And um, uh, today one person posted on social media said, reading the commentary on this book, like it's interesting to see a Chinese guy telling this story with a Chinese slant. It's, it's not really, I, I, okay, I'll, I'll accept. You know, it's, a, it's a loaded term, slant, but I know, what, you know, I, I may, you know, so, so what I'm trying to say is that um, who is trying to hang out and how do I describe all this? And I have to really kind of respect her in a sense, her very traditional upbringing, mm -hmm. her impossible rise from, you know, Dr. Wolong to a global star. But the thing is, the reason I want to ask her if you have fun is that, well, because of anti miscegenation laws, um, her, her friend had to hide you know, his marriage to a white woman for decades. And Annie Wong, of course, looking at that, their close friends, of course, learn from James Howe's uh, experience. And uh, you know, if the law says you, know, you can't interracial, there's no interracial marriage until you know, 1967, right? Um, but, but actually, as a matter of fact, you study Asian American history, you know, a lot of working class, on the level of working class, Irish women will marry China men at the risk of losing their citizenship. Mm -hmm. But if you're working class, nobody will go after you. The authorities will never go after you. But she's a big star. The minute if she, if she marries a white man, then she could be in trouble or the white man could be in trouble. So she's probably having a lot of affairs, but she will not, of course, go as far as say, you know, she has a limit, I think. And in that sense, she's really Chinese, you know, not just like getting laid and they're having fun with it. And she will often say in her letters, once again, say, you know, why lose my head, you know, with nothing you know, yeah. uh, solid can come yeah. out of this. Well, so in that sense, she's really Chinese. So, so writing this book, all these books actually, I kind of try to manage um, the, the storytelling in the sense that uh, I'm not into that kind of you know, naked American style confession, like pouring a heart out and everything. Uh, I do believe this kind of yin yang in terms of uh, show, tell, American show and tell, but conceal is also important. Withhold, show, tell, and withhold, I think this is uh, the trick uh, mm. to some extent, uh, uh, or if you want to say, you know, kung fu move <laughs> in writing. Uh, so I, I treated all my subjects in, in, in such a manner, you know, if you read carefully, actually I'm trying to not just like say, this is all, you know, you can know, but I don't buy yeah. that. This is my last question, so get ready for your questions. Um, a treasure in this book is really hearing Anna Mae Wong's voice. Uh, Yun Tae does such a good job mining you know, her letters. She was such a beautiful writer. Um, and she really embodied the theme of the exhibit that's happening up here at Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Um, you know, when she first spoke in the movie, she transitioned from the silent uh, screen to talkies. People were so shocked that she had such a California girl accent. It, it just, they could not handle it. They expected something else. The other thing that I really want you to leave with today is how she was so devoted to her craft. If you haven't seen Toll of the Sea, it, it's a silent film, but um, she'll just make you cry because her face just has so much emotion, you know? So there's a sculpture up here at the museum by Banerjee, an immigrant daisy woman, who describes her migration as one of feeling alienation and dislocation. And perhaps one of the most painful journeys that we trace in your book, Yonte, is how, as a very young woman in her teens, Anna Mae Wong played you know, in really big films. Like her first film, she was the star. you know, And they were the first Technicolor film as well. 
And then as she aged, she, you know, her roles became much more minor. She, you know, one of her last films, she played a maid lurking in the dark. I mean, it's just so painful to watch, you know, just all of that talent to which she was devoted. And so if you think about what we have today, you know, we think about Michelle Yeoh's recent win at, of the Oscar at age 60, you know. So it's, you know, she became essentially, you know, a cast off. And I think this, this sculpture that, you know, I saw up there, you know, it's really about this kind of wounding, you know, that happens when you undergo such a sacrifice, you know, where for her, she, you know, this book, I think, it, it really captures that. It makes an artwork out of her life, you know, even the way, you, you know, Yonte closes the book with going to her grave, you know. You know, if you look at the grave, you'll see that it wasn't her name. Anna Mae Wong is not listed. She was listed with her Chinese name among her sisters in her mother's gravestone. You know, so she didn't even, you know, if you go to Bruce Lee's grave, he has a grave. Brandon Lee has a grave. You know, it's, it's really, you know, hard to find. So you can barely see her name. So this book, you know, itself is a gravestone, a memorial. It's a monument of a really massive life. And, you know, Yunte really makes her um, come alive, you know, in a way where she really remains a model for so many Asian American women scholars <laughs> and women filmmakers. Um, and I'm just so grateful for the great gift that you've given us um, in terms of helping us to better understand. So, you know, I'm gonna begin with, I'm gonna end with the same question I asked, like, why are you stopping, Yunte? I mean, is it, is it the, um, the message that it's your students who are gonna take up what's next? Is it up to the next generation to take heed of the predecessors whom you've honored in this trilogy? I just don't want you to stop, but maybe you're doing other things. So what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you can't stop, of course. Yeah. Um, yes, she's so, she works, I call her, you know, the star coolie uh, in Hollywood's dream factory, really. She mm. was really the star coolie, not just the person who turned, you know, coolie hat, coolie jacket into high fashion, uh, but also worked her, you know, butt off, really, literally. Toward the last minute, like I said, to continue, she was about to make the big comeback, like a Norman, Norma Desmond style, you know, a different style comeback uh, with a flower drum song. Mm -hmm. uh, she, would, uh, she was uh, giving a big part to show off her singing, performance, dancing, and everything. Uh, and so she was really, you know, um, working on the screen, uh, the script at her house in Santa Monica, uh, you know, in Santa Monica, and she died of a heart attack with a screenplay next to her at the age of 56. Um, so speaking of her talent, and one thing I found out uh, through, you know, of course many people have written about her biographies, you know, there are quite a few biographies about her in the past few decades, but one thing nobody actually talked about was that she's actually a brilliant writer, mm -hmm. okay? I read through her, you know, 200, over 200 letters to uh, Colin Racton, House at the Beinecke. Um and her serialized, you know, articles published, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on New York Tribune and uh, about her trips to China. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I quote from her, kind of. Uh, uh, when my editor was re editing my manuscript, he called me and said, like, "Inta, do you think she has a ghostwriter?" <laughs> Come on, Bob, nobody has a ghostwriter to, to write personal letters, you know. <laughs> <laughs> she was writing a casual, you know, personal letter to the wife, yeah. to wife of, of uh, Calvin Macton, of course. And she, her style, she barely graduated from high school in LA. Yeah. And that's how good she was yeah. and, you know, how hard work she was. But coming back, I would like to think of myself as a coolie, <laughs> <an> academic. <laughs> well, I, I call myself like a migrant, intellectual migrant worker to some extent. Um, well, um, my next book, actually not, I would say um, I'm writing about Confucius. You know, because at one of the, uh, Anime One has two pet phrases. One is, you know, orientally yours. And the other is, and Confucius didn't say this. That's right. <laughs> and then she will move on to her own dead pen. Shanghai Express, for instance, you know, in, in terms of noirish film, she's actually very good. She had the better, mm -hmm. much better dead pens than Marlena Dietrich. Mm -hmm. right? 
So I followed, took a page from her. If Confucius didn't say this, I want to find out what Confucius actually said. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm writing this the other book for a very different reason. It has to do with you know, I'm, my concern with like how we organize ourselves as democracy. Or and Confucius had an idea from many years ago in comparison to Aristotle and and all the ancient Greek. Mm. So I'm doing kind of cultural kind of comparison in terms of how yeah. we organize ourselves. Thank you for sharing that. There's so many uh, brilliant and beautiful people out there. If you have any questions, please ask it. I see the renowned writer Samir Pandya at the corner over there. The legendary Constance Penley is here. Um, folk, uh, but but Con Constance is going to save her questions because she's interviewing him in two weeks right. uh, on campus. Um, this is your chance to talk to the scholar and writer here today. Does someone have, a, have their hand raised? Yes, right here. Angelica, you see it? There's a gentleman here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I wondered if uh, Anna Mae Wong had any uh, contacts with the new growing uh, movie making market in China. Did she ever think of going there or did anyone ever oh, she did. Mm -hmm. approach her to come make a movie in, in China? Yeah, so yes, absolutely. She, um, so she was born in this country, uh, so was her father, her, her parents. But her father eventually um, went to China, as a lot of old Chinese people did, uh, despite the fact it was born here. Because you know the, the, the construction of Union Station in LA, as you know, kind of you know, basically destroyed uh, Chinatown, old Chinatown, so her, including her father's laundry. After that, he went back. And so Annie Wang, after her heartbroken by having not being able to get the big part in Good Earth, uh, she went to China. In 1936, and in there, with the purpose actually of uh, bringing Chinese opera, picking opera, mm -hmm. and trying to popularize it in the world, and that's really so. She was how devoted she was, how serious she was about you know, performance and everything, and and always to some extent how Chinese is to some extent. So yeah, so over there, of course, there's always the talk of you know her making a Chinese film, and she also talked about she wanted to make a a kind of travel log sort of kind of documentary. And she actually did, it was a homemade video. Right? That's right. And uh, she eventually, they actually showed that on uh, NBC uh, some years later. So absolutely, she was, you know, there's a lot of conversation and talk and uh, of that possibility. So that's 1936. So. It's interesting, much like Sashua Hayakawa, who was also a massive yes. star at the time that she was, he wanted to produce counter images and she was so famously saying, why do they insult us so much? Uh -huh. You yeah. know, we have thousand-year-old rich culture. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Back there, in the hat. Um, I oh, do you mind waiting for the microphone? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I was wondering if you could speak about her time in Germany and maybe her reasons um, for feeling more free in Europe and in Germany, and then, of course, her return, uh, the reasons for her return. OK, well, thank you. Um, so she went to Germany after she was really disappointed by her, you know, her early rise, despite her early rise, and you know, she wasn't able to get a, a big part. Uh, in 1927, speaking of Chinese you know, exoticism, that's what really the height of Hollywood's Orientalism when they built the Chinese, Grauman Chinese theater. In the heart of Hollywood is this kind of mecca of Orientalism. So that year, there were at least like four China films, so-called. Annie Wong was there, every single one of them. But she wasn't able to get a big part. And that's really the paradox, the dilemma. So she took off for Germany. And she arrived in Germany, of course. Depending how you look at it, uh, whether it's good or bad, was the Weimar Republic. It was kind of about a decade-long kind of sudden explosion of artistic you know, um, freedom. That was right before the rise of Nazis, of course. And so she was able to make quite a few film, German films. I'm actually going to San Francisco in um, early December. They have a silent film festival. 
um, you know, Pale Man Butterfly was one of the mm. German films, silent films, they're going to show. So yeah. I'm going to introduce that film there. Um, so apparently, uh, I'm not saying Hollywood, uh, Europe did not have racial issues, <laughs> far from it. You know, this is only a few years before the rise of the Nazis. At least, outside of the kind of Hollywood, um, kind of Puritan, kind of sort of kind of conservatism or, or the limitation. She did enjoy a, a, about two years of kind of sort of artistic freedom in Europe as a big celebrity, as an icon. But of course, the restrictions are still there. You know, the kiss, there's no interracial kiss. Mm -hmm. I mean, Piccadilly was as far as she could go. Yeah. There's a shot of about the embrace and embrace and everything. And uh, so she went to Europe, really, was trying to come back the same way as Josephine Baker, really. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, she, you know, she was heartbroken. But Annie Wang at least made the journey back and was recognized for a while as the big star. And she did make a, quite a few kind of big films. Right? You know, the Daughter of the Dragon, Dr. Fu Manchu's daughter, and uh, the name Marina DJ, right? mm -hmm. Shanghai Express. She had a good time. I would, the way I put it, you know, is the, remember my question for her? She did have a great time in Europe in those two years. And in China. She had fun. In China, too. Yeah. And in the Philippines, of course. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Treated by the, the president of the Philippines. Yeah. yeah. Big parties, yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question, Patsy. Right here. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Um, the West has always feminized the Asian man, and fetishized Asian women, hyper-fetishized uh, Asian women. And as much as that's a detriment, were there ever instances where she used that to her advantage in Hollywood? Well, in a way, her career you know, speaks for itself, the success and the failure, the limit, the, the rise, the fact she will you know, be cast for the big role at the age of 17, uh, the tall, the sea, these are like the first Technicolor, right? So she, it's um, like unthinkable because the, the, the standard practice was a yellow face. You know, everybody, Caucasian actors playing Chinese characters, no real Chinese or Asian except for Sesu Hayakawa, right? That's one exception. So she, that gave her a foot in but the limitation, of course, even with that toll of the sea, the reason she was cast for the lead role was because they, were really real, they need real Asian actors to test the color, how good the color is, look on your skin, to can contrast with the Caucasian actors, how they look. So this is the cynical part. And that, you know, that, that experience really captures the overall kind of exactly what you said. Uh, to some extent, she knows it, uh, why she became successful, what the attraction is, and the limitation is. The same way, like I said, you know, the Siamese twins knew why you know, people would come pay to see them and how they took advantage of this, despite the abuse of verbal and the physical, psychological, and everything. Right? So, yeah. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, I want to make sure that we don't leave the room actually believing that there is this you know, very simple binary between the way Asian women are sexualized and the way Asian men are sexualized. I think you'll see in the you know, work of Seshua Hayakawa, the movie star, he was second only to Rudolph Valentino for how many women fainted in his presence. Right. And he played a rapacious villain with a very aggressive sexuality on screen, uh -huh. one that he really tried to undo in his own movies. And he was not alone. I mean, there were other actors like Philip Ahn, James Shigeta. And you know, this is precisely what's so great about Yunte's work and mine in terms of <laughs> right, yes. the way we complicate you know, sexuality and gender and precisely the ways in which Asian American actors have defied you know, mm. those simplified ideas. Right, yeah. it's really, it's, a, it's like fight within this very limited space how to push back. And that's really the struggle. You know, they know what they're doing and they know what they're up against. So I want to thank you both for an exceptional conversation, so thought-provoking, in some ways heartbreaking, and in other ways often very humorous, um, but always very human. And um, I think we'll have to bring you back to talk about what Confucius did say <laughs> <laughs> and what Celine has to say about what you both said. Um, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. 
Um, remember, we do have a book signing just outside in the lobby. And before we let these two distinguished scholars, authors, and people leave the stage, please join me in giving them a, a large thank you. Oh, um, will you indulge us with a group selfie? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>